Uh, hello, I wanted to make a quick video that will hopefully expedite the learning process for provenance of aulos. So first of all, what is the title? So provenance is just a fancy word for origin. And then aulos is a Greek instrument, an ancient Greek instrument, consisting of two tubes, each with a double reed at the end. The player effectively has four reeds in their mouth when they're playing this instrument. That leads to some intonation issues. Uh, but it's a really interesting sound that I would recommend you uh, go and look up. The instrument has a mythological origin story, and the intent of this piece is to try and musically interpret that. So one of Perseus's uh, exploits involved going to kill Medusa, one of the Gorgons. He had to go collect a bunch of items and then go eventually uh, off to go battle with Medusa. He wins the battle, of course, and then has to flee from her Gorgon sisters. Uh, but the Gorgon sisters are not terribly happy about the fact that their sister was killed, so, so they start wailing, and Athena created the Allos to, to make those sounds of the wailing Gorgons. So in this piece, the, the Allos is not represented as a, 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 a beautiful instrument, but it, it makes some nice sounds. Um, so, to begin with, we state a theme, it just takes eight bars, there's not much interesting to discuss in that part. Uh, moving on, though, we, we immediately enter a section in 7-8. So, most of the 7-8 in this piece is felt in groups of uh, 4 plus 3. So, the ostinato felt by the, uh, in the tenors here goes dot 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 uh, there are some other motifs here uh, which are written in 7-8 but are really felt more in alternate time signatures. So here if we consider the low end and the lower alto saxes, so this is written in 7-8 but felt more in 4, right? So we can read this straight across ignoring the bar lines somewhat and uh, interpret it instead as 4 plus 4 plus 2 at the very end. and that may, that, is significantly easier to read than what we than uh, interpreting it in seven eight. So after we have four bars of the ostinato, we have da 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 da. da. Then we go on to the four four, right? Da 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 da. The four one two da, and then we go on to some other part. Uh, so we have seven eight with four four on top of it, and then we have these other little. It noodly bits here. They're supposed to be slithering like a snake. We introduce that 4-4 part again. Then here, uh, altos 1 through 3 add another time signature on top of this. This is essentially in 6-8, but we can't make it line up perfectly, so there's a, a little gap right here. There's just an extra eighth note added into the, the whole pattern. So if I begin from one bar before E, we have da 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 right so we have that little hiccup in the middle but otherwise it's 6 8 and this is on top of the uh the 7 8 feel i i should mention that i'll go ahead and play the midi at the end of this introduction so you understand how it all kind of fits together a bit better but i wouldn't listen to it too many times i don't want to influence your uh interpretation of the piece. Here we have another part in 6-8 that's a little easier to wrap your head around. Uh, right. Then the ostinato finally breaks into a variation in 6-4, which builds up to the full ensemble. And then we fall down into this uh, this part here in 5-4. So in, in, my, in my head, I think of this section in 5 as, as sort of a harmonic palate cleanser. The, the, there's a lot of harmonic amb ambiguity in this section. Uh, if you wanted to, you could interpret every two bars as, an, as a different key signature, but that would be a kind of a pain to write, so, so we'll just keep it all in the same key. Because ultimately, when we, when we get through all of this, we come out in the same key we started in. But the, in, the hope is that uh, in going and modulating through all these different keys, uh, arriving at the same place should still feel like a completely new place. So... Uh, we have another wacky time signature here. Uh, this one's 13-8. In this case, we're dividing it into group uh, three groups of three and then one group of four. 
there's this arpeggio line that goes between the parts all the way from the sopranos all the way down to the to the bass saxophone and then it comes part of the way back up this arpeggio really needs to be rhythmically consistent so in 13 this arpeggio would sound something like etc so that, that's the pulse for feeling once you get your head around that, this entire section isn't too awful. So from J until, let's see, uh, for quite a while, what we're doing is playing around with the main theme. Then we, uh, once we get to N here, we have our first solo of the piece. This is an alto solo. Uh, and again, it's another variation of the, the main uh, statement we made way at the beginning of the piece. Uh, so that goes on for quite a while longer. Uh, there's nothing too challenging in that solo, I don't think. Uh, then we come into R, and we have a, a third statement of the theme, but this time with a full, bombastic, angry ensemble. So once we're done with that 13-8 stuff, we, we pare down back into 7-8 with smaller ensembles. The ostinato, this time, is a slight variation on what we had before. Uh, before, we just had dot, 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 which is that first measure repeated over and over again. But now we have the second measure, so it becomes da 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 So before our ostinato was just this first measure, right? Da 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 da. But now we extended it into a two-measure pattern, which goes da 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 in the second measure. Instead of one, two, one, two, one, two, three, we have one, two, one, two, three, one, two. There's another way you can think of this ostinato, though, uh, which is to instead think of it in seven, four. I didn't write it that way here because I wanted to make it clear that this was just a variation of the pri uh, previous ostinato. But if it's simpler, uh, you can certainly think of this section in seven, four, or even conduct it that way. Uh, if you do it in seven, four, you have dot, dot, dagger, dot, da 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 uh, at X now, we, we simplify the ostinato to just quarter notes. Uh, we reintroduce this uh, motif that we introduced way at the beginning, and we slowly start fading away into, into silence as Medusa dies effectively. So here at Z, we have a traditional quartet setup. The soprano has the solo melody, and the, and the rest of the voices support that. What this is, really, is just a major restatement of the theme when the quartet section is over, then we introduce more of the ensemble and it becomes uh, a, a more grand major statement of the theme, also rhythmically a little bit simpler. On the third major statement of the theme, then, we introduce these large flourishes in the soprano, and also the, the bass comes in bold and strong, playing some of their lowest notes. So finishing up this major section, we uh, actually modulate back into our, our previous key. The, the upper voices all restate the main theme in its uh, simplest form, rather slowly, while at the very bottom end, the, the, we have a berry solo. So the, the goal here is really to make the, the berry cry as much as possible. I want to note that in this last measure, these circles represent altissimo, uh, but it's going to be kind of difficult to land right on that last note. So really, th this is, these last couple of notes are more of a suggestion. The, the, the goal here is just to go really high on the altissimo register because we're going to do something kind of interesting right after this. For a moment, let's ignore the snakes. The conductor will be conducting essentially the outer voices, the, so the sopranos and the very low end uh, in four, right? So the sopranos, the soprano one is going to spend most of their time uh, in the altissimo register, and the second soprano, uh, maybe not so much so, but they're still going to be really high. So I, I realize that up there, it's extremely difficult to stay in tune, and that's great. This section here is supposed to uh, kind of represent the the Aulos instrument coming into existence, right? 
the allos is a, a rather difficult instrument to keep in tune. You have these two pipes, and you have to, for every interval, you have to push one in your mouth and pull out the other slightly, or vice versa. And it, it's a really difficult instrument to keep in tune, but you can negotiate a little. Uh, if it's not in tune initially, you can make it go in tune. So, for this section, starting out in tune, not not an, uh, don't worry about it. It's probably not going to happen, and it doesn't have to. Uh, I'd almost rather it wasn't in tune, or at least not at first. You can bend to be in tune uh, later, but don't worry too much about intonation uh, in the sopranos. Uh, at, at the low end, the bass voices have a much easier job. They're just there to uh, give the response to the, the screeching sopranos up the other end, because the, the sopranos are representative of the gorgons screaming, essentially, and the, the bass is... Uh, just echoing that sentiment, sentiment, but much lower. Now then, so the the, the interesting bit is probably uh, everyone else, right? So this is what the full page looks like. Uh, on, on your parts, you're only going to see a small cutout of uh, of this array of snakes. So what I'm trying to show here pictographically is, is that uh, Medusa's dead off to the right of the page here, and this is her snaky hair. Uh, laying down uh, over the notes here. So th the notes on, on alto 1 through 10 or 4 uh, are, are just cues. They're cues for uh, the other extreme voices so that you have a good idea of what they're playing. The snakes themselves are meant to approximate the duration and pitch uh, that I uh, recommend you play. The first instrument to come in would be alto 5, right? And they would play for approximately two bars, and then they'd rest for another three bars, and they come in at the end of the uh, the bar after that, right? So in interpreting these snakes, uh, I don't want you to hold a tone necessarily. The, the goal here is to make a, a wiggly type of sound. So th think Indiana Jones, right? He's there's a, a if I recall correctly, there's a scene where there's a bunch of snakes writhing around on the floor. That's the kind of musical imagery we're trying to evoke here, right? Um, but this doesn't mean extreme dissonance and and uh, chromaticism necessarily. So that's why we have these cue notes. So you know uh, approximately what is set in stone, and then you can play a note that doesn't clash with that uh, intensely, right? It's going to take a few times practicing it, but really uh, the notes you choose to play over these snakes uh, shouldn't clash uh, with the extreme voices or those people around you, and you you shouldn't be holding long tones either. For example, if we take uh, this is a, an easy example comparatively, right? But if we look at the alto five, it would be reasonable to to s flutter back and forth between the D and the B for a second because we know the B is already being played, so that's going to be pretty fine. And then D is a major second away from E, which is a decent interval, right? But you're going to want to avoid tritones and minor seconds and major sevenths and that sort of thing. But most other notes are fair game as long as no one around you is clashing directly. So going through this entire section, the volume will build just by the fact that we have instruments being added. So what one thing I haven't considered here is how many instruments ought to be on each part. Um, my inclination is to say that the more the merrier, that's totally fine, but if it, be if it becomes too unwieldy and, and uh, the extreme voices are lost completely, then you may want to consider uh, paring down to just one player per part. But I'm, I'm okay with more people. It can be a cacophony, but it just can't clash too directly with the, uh, with the, the set in stone parts. So after that, uh, you got to watch the conductor carefully because we're going to pop right back into 7-8 in our initial ostinato uh, and a tenor solo. After the solo, we arrive back in the palate cleanser type section. This time there's even more harmonic ambiguity around double P and double Q. Uh, we build up intensity until we get to this final uh, section here from RR to the end, right? We begin with a big unison ostinato pattern, then we move on to something stacked in fourths, then back to unison, then back to fourths. Then we build both in volume and in chord complexity until we get to the last uh, note, and then we all unison at the end. So these last five or so measures, the, the actual rhythm here at the very end isn't super important. The, the important part is that you're together 
Um, and as long as the rhythm is jarring, th then it's right. So if you're unable to play the exact rhythm together, then, then the director can is more than welcome to uh, change the rhythm slightly. And that's uh, all the most difficult parts, aside from the individual solos. Like those will, of course, you need to spend some time on those. So we'll go ahead and make a full playthrough of the piece just uh, on this not so great MIDI file, but uh, hopefully you get something out of it. <laughs> Bye. 
Thank you. 